what this one's dedicated to is all about. Today, we are live at the San Antonio Book Festival. Or, for our first ever in-person episode of this one's dedicated to, with our special guest, Naomi Shiab Nye. Would you please kick us off by uh, reading aloud the dedication in your latest book? I am so touched to be part of this series because I too have always been fascinated by dedications in books and you want to be a little bit of a detective to like, who is that person? If they just put initials, what does it mean? Why are they being a little secretive? Anyway. In respectful memory, Sultan Qaboos bin Said Al Said, 1940 to 2020. So you mentioned Sultan Qaboos in the very first chapter of this book's predecessor, The Turtle of Oman. When your eight-year-old Omani main character, RF, says, the Sultan is the boss, you don't see him very much. For a non-Omani eight-year-old, how would you describe the significance of Sultan Qaboos in general and his significance in the Turtle of Michigan in particular? Wow, great question. Well, that's true. He is mentioned in both books, and my main character, who is seven and eight, is very, very intrigued by him and wants to see him, like with his own eyes, not just in the pictures that hang everywhere around Oman. And so he keeps asking people, have you ever seen him? And his grandfather has seen him once from far away. But I guess with um, kids elsewhere, like kids in this country, I would say, you know, we're used to seeing presidents of all styles on TV and hearing them talk and seeing headlines about them. But in some countries, the ruler is in power um, different lengths of time. In the case of Sultan Qaboos, very, very long time. And, um, and you almost never see him, and you actually don't read that much about him. So he's like a secret boss, ruler of your country, who's doing things behind the scenes, and you hope they're good. And kids are interested in that. Like, yeah, you hope they're good. What are they doing? Where are they? I did not know, by the way, when I wrote this book, that the book would be dedicated to the Sultan. But I have been fascinated by him myself since I was very young. And since he died while I was working on this book, and so that then became part of the story, um, I thought it was appropriate. But I have to just tell a story about like how my intrigue solidified with him. So when I was about 10 or 12 years old, I read a story in a National Geographic magazine about Oman. And I was absolutely captivated by this story. And I said to my father, I want to go there. And my father said, so do I, but we can't. And I said, what do you mean? He said, it's not open to tourists. It's a closed country. So that intrigued me because um, what was a closed country? What else was a closed country? And, and it's true that Oman changed so much from the 70s till now when anyone could travel there. I always let it be known that I wanted to go to Oman. When people would say, where's a place you haven't been in the world where you'd like to go? And then people would say, oh, I know someone who teaches there. I'll spread the word. So finally, I got an invitation to go there. And I was at a school working in Oman, the American International School of Muscat, called Teism, which almost sounds like a religion, but they're very multicultural school. And the school is in English, as the international school systems, you may know, are all, many of them, well, they teach in English. Even if they're sponsored by different countries, the international schools use English as the school language. Um, while I was there, the school received an anonymous $125,000 check. This was like on my first day of being at the school. So all the teachers were buzzing about this in the teacher's lounge. And I said, well, who did the check come from? They said, well, we don't know, but it must be from the Sultan. 
And I said, but why? Why would he send an anonymous check? Why wouldn't he sign it? And say, they said, because then the other schools would get jealous. But the reason that the check was sent was because one of the students in that school had just won, and this linked to my brain, the National Geographic Worldwide Photography Contest. So that was so exciting and received like a big headline in the Muscat paper that they felt the Sultan was offering his uh, congratulations by this secret check. So then I got even more interested in him. Well, I love that, the idea that somebody would rally to a child's prize and, and give the school a big gift. And they all said, well, you know how much he loves art and culture. That's his thing. And I said, fantastic. My love for him from afar has not been misplaced. Now, I have no idea if he ever saw the Turtle of Oman. I think I did leave him a copy uh, with someone at some consul or something in some visa office or somewhere in Muscat signed to him and said, could you get this to him? I didn't know how to get him a book, um, but I don't know if he ever saw it. But it is the only book of mine to this day that's being translated into Arabic. So from a publisher in Muscat. So maybe he did. Who knows? Maybe he was behind that. I don't even know it. Can you talk a little more about when you were um, teaching in Oman and what did you learn? Uh, well, what, did, what else did you learn about the Sultan uh, Qaboos? I don't think I knew before I went there what a huge champion of reading and art and culture he was. Because that's how everybody in the country thought of him. They had a cultural art festival that lasted 30 days. It was every evening and it was completely free and it was amazing. I got to attend two full weeks of it and it was just unbelievable. I mean, what place do we know that has a 30-day cultural festival where different aspects of art and culture are highlighted every night and the neighborhoods just pour out, everyone is welcome. I mean, and that he was the backer of that. You know, we have to do this. I also knew he was the backer of protected beaches for the sea turtles. That was very, very, very important to him. So to me, that was enough to really like him. <laughs> you talked about his support of books and culture and reading, and which sounds wonderful and fantastic. Can you talk a little bit about your own reading? And, and have you ever wondered about book dedications? Did always. You notice them? Yes, always. And then how do you approach them when you do them yourself, usually? Well, I mean, it's, it's nice to dedicate to your family and your editor and your best friends. But I think sometimes, you know, sometimes it's nice to have unexpected dedications, like to the friends I haven't met yet. I think I dedicated one of those books, one book, early book to that. And, um, you know, to, to all the friendships in the world and to the people we still have yet to know and, you know, that kind of general dedication, but there's something very intimate about a dedication. I mean, you just get a sense of what's hovering in an author's mind as they as they are working. It's like the address on the letter somehow. The book is the letter. We're all receiving the letter if we're reading the book, but who was it kind of addressed to? Who was thought of? people like to dedicate poems also to other people. And that's the nice thing about being a poet, because you can have a whole lot of dedication. <laughs> like lots and lots. You can dedicate to everyone you ever do. 